um, the depression hit. Now, one thing that's really interesting about Roma Wilson was her father. And um, her father is Bert, was Burt Wilson. He was the president of the Eureka College, so she was the president's daughter. And I don't know how many of you have seen the movie Footloose. I remember Footloose. Okay, the movie, this guy, uh, uh, he bands dancing at school and everybody hates him and all this stuff. Well, anyway, Bert Wilson was uh, a, part of the Disciples of Christ. He was a minister. Um, he um, was great at fundraising, but he was also very fundamentalist in fire and brimstone. And as the president of the uh, college, he decided that, he did, he, uh, that dancing was part of the devil's work, so he banned it. And he also banned smoking. And at the same time, there was also a problem with finances at the college. There were on rough times, they had to cut faculty, and so the students got really mad at Bert Wilson. This is Rome's father, and they wanted Alston. So they got one student to lead a, a revolt, a, a, a protest and a strike against Bert Wilson. And this fellow is right here. And does anybody know who that is? Ronald Reagan. <laughs> That's another than Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan was an 18-year-old freshman in 1928, and he brought down Burt Wilson. They recruited Ronald Reagan. He was a, a charismatic, flamboyant, handsome, young freshman. He took this challenge, and he gave his first speech, and he said that's when his political career started. And it was one of the most successful political careers in the history of America for 50 years. But there was one thing that Ronald Reagan didn't succeed at, and that was getting a, a vote from Ronald Wilson. She never voted for Dutch Reagan. <laughs> Anyway, so Harvey uh, found that his, um, besides athletics, uh, he had a natural ability for mathematics. He was a genius. He was very much left brain dominant. Analyses, uh, they just dominated his thinking. So uh, math fit uh, a corner in his analytical mind better than a right triangle. It's perfect for him. He went on to pursue a master's and then a PhD in mathematics in Illinois. Well, then his career would have him bouncing around the Midwest. He went to uh, Indiana, Indiana, and then he went to uh, Missouri, and then Oklahoma, and then ultimately uh, Grinnell, Iowa. This is in Oklahoma, and, and he, there's Rama, they, uh, their daughter Anne was born in 1935, and then Jim was born in 1939. Um, one of the things about Harvey, though, he, uh, ever since his days in Mount Michan, he craved to go hiking. He desired to get back out and, and physically challenge himself in wild terrain. It was hard to do in the, the breadbasket of uh, the flat Midwest. And so every summer when he school it out, he would take the family to pack in the, the 1934 Ford, his first real car. Uh, they called it King Henry. And they would head out to Estes Park, Colorado, and he'd hike his brains out in the Rocky Mountains. And he had a goal to hike all the 14,000 foot peaks. There was 55 of them. I think that's correct. He would ultimately hike all of them, but five. In one two week stretch, he actually did, thir he did in 14 days, he did 13. That's what kind of hiker he was. So anyway, I think he just got done hiking here anyway. Uh, something. Um, but ultimately, uh, his professorship led him to Northern Arizona University, which at the time was Arizona State College, and Flagstaff. Flagstaff in 1945 had a population of about 5,000. The university, uh, coming off the, the tail end of World War II, only had 161 students. Harvey accepted a job. The only job that was offered to him in the West as mathematics professor. Now he took this job more by circumstance than uh, choice. His daughter asthma, or his daughter Anne, had contracted asthma, and the doctor said there was no good treatment for him or for her, and so the best hope was to move to a dry climate, and that was uh, West. And this is the only place that offered him a job. There was only one other professor, and when Harvey arrived here, he ended up being basically the entire math department. He taught 13 different classes from. Uh, math for elementary teachers to uh, um, synthetic uh, um, uh, was geometry. His specialty actually was uh, differential geometry. He was known to be able to draw perfect circles sim uh, simultaneously. He had uncanny ability to do that. His uh, mathematics thesis, his PhD thesis was called Helices and Euclidean End Space. It was an incredible undertaking. He thought it was the greatest thing he ever did, accomplishment in his career. At one point, he had a 20-foot long piece of, of a packaging paper that he worked on uh, this mathematics problem from one end to the other. He would chuck it over a table, the other end over another table, and jump back and forth and work on it. Pre-calculators, pre-computers. Pre, uh, <laughs> to put it in perspective, it was hard work. So anyway, he shows up at NAU as a mathematics professor, and uh, he wasn't 
regarded as a real dynamic teacher, but he was always there for his students, always willing to share his information and his knowledge. Okay, so there he is, mathematics professor. This was taken by Fronsky's studio here in Flagstaff. And this is another big part of the puzzle. Harvey ends up at Flagstaff, in a lot of ways, by destiny. And now his own, his, uh, the mythical grand cane of his youth from Mount Michelin days is in his own backyard. And he's itching to get out and stretch his hiker's legs that have been dormant for all these years. In 1945, when Harvey showed up, uh, he of course was intrigued by the country. Um, his daughter Jasmine well, played a big part in him coming out here, but uh, those summers that he spent in the Rockies had whetted his appetite for hiking again like he'd done when he was a kid. And so when he got to Arizona, he was ecstatic. He couldn't wait to see the country. And he, uh, of course, wanted to see Grand Canyon, the painting that had been on the wall since he was a small child in China. And it took him all of two weeks to uh, make his first trip there after he moved here at Flagstaff. Um, I want to diverge a little bit from Harvey's story just to give you a little background on the canyon first. These petroglyphs right here are uh, one of the few reminders or, or few pieces of evidence that we have for the culture, uh, or cultures I should say, that used to inhabit Grand Canyon. When Harvey got here in 1945, the canyon was in one of its relative uh, cyclic spells of abandonment. And what I mean by that is, throughout time, over the course of thousands of years, Grand Canyon has at times been a place of um, a teeming population, followed by abandonment, followed by another teeming population, and then successive abandonment. So there's been these pulses of humanity that have come into Grand Canyon over time. This is one of the oldest pieces of evidence. Um, this is some archaic rock art from the Western Grand Canyon. And nobody really knows exactly how old these are. 2,500, 4,000 years are the usual guesses. Who knows? Um, but we know that people were here a long time ago. And of course, the uh, uh, most famous of the Indian cultures that were pre-Columbian were the Anasazi. And there are a few places in Grand Canyon where the Anasazi did not uh, travel. Their habitation sites, like this cliff dwelling here, are all over the place. They're rock art. Um, you can find traces of them here and there. And they knew Grand Canyon better than anybody ever did or probably would. This is a cache of eight pots that Harvey discovered with a man named Donald Davis in the late 1960s in a cave in Lava Canyon. And this is the just a little bit more evidence of the past cultures that once made Grand Canyon home, that once knew the roots in Grand Canyon, the places to camp, the places to gather food, the water sources, and the rhythms of the place. And of course, without written language, they had no way to leave any record of their passing. By the 1300s, the ancestors of the modern Havasupai Indians, which is this fellow here, uh, the Wallapai Indians, and also the Paiute Indians, began to move into Grand Canyon after the Anasazi left, and they began to recycle these roots that the Anasazi had used. And once again, the canyon teemed with activity. However, by the time of the late 1800s and the arrival of European Americans, that all came to a halt. In the late 1800s, there was a brief period of uh, excitement surrounding the potential for valuable minerals in Grand Canyon, and you had a wave of miners that flooded into the place and uh, searched for valuable ore, and of course, uh, the kind of rocks that you find in Grand Canyon aren't conducive to that kind of thing. Hence, the miners came and left, and with them went any knowledge of how to move, where to go, what the roots were in Grand Canyon. By the time of the railroad in 1901, the government finally realized that there was a need for a modern topographic map for the first time. And that was when Francois Mathis and Richard Evans, creators of the first topographic map in Grand Canyon, were sent to correct the situation. Francois Mathis, he was the eminent uh, topographer of his time. He not only mapped uh, Grand Canyon, but also established the first topographic maps of Yosemite, Mount Rainier, and the San Andreas Fault. And he did consider Yosemite far more difficult than what he confronted at Grand Canyon. 